Good afternoon. I am uh, Ernesto Cedillo, uh, now a professor at Yale University. I, I used to sit uh, in the chair that now President Calderon will be seated for, for, for six years. Are you missing? Or... Uh, no, not at this moment, sir. <laughs> uh, and uh, we are here to have the Latin American plenary. I am very glad that there is a Latin American plenary because ours is a very important region of the world. Our region as a whole produces uh, a GDP of uh, 5.7 trillion, and we have 570 million people in our region. And uh, I am very pleased that we have very authoritative voices uh, representing the region uh, to have this uh, conversation. We have the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Jose Miguel Insulza. We have uh, President Alvaro Uribe of Colombia, and we have my President, uh, President uh, Calderon. Uh, so the idea here is to start right away with uh, questions. This is not a session for speeches. And let me start uh, with a hemispheric view on uh, something which is uh, very important, uh, U.S.-Latin American relations. There is a sentiment in the region that the last few years have not been particularly propitious for an engagement between Latin America and the United States. We have now a new government in the White House, and the question is, uh, Secretary Insulza, should we Latin Americans have... Uh, an expectation that uh, relationships between the U.S. and Latin America uh, will improve, will be more engagement? Thank you very much. I think that there is uh, no doubt that uh, the election of President Obama has created a great expectation in Latin America and that he is received with a lot of goodwill. There is a goodwill, a willingness of the of the Latin Americans and, uh, to, to get along with the U.S. as they feel that they have not gone along with uh, in the past few years. Of course, we have a very strong agenda. I think it's not, never been a problem of agenda in terms of, the, of the, the topics. The topics are there. And when the president of the U.S. meets the, the leaders of the, of, the, of the rest of the Americas in, in Trinidad and Tobago by the end of April, they will want to talk about the crisis because they, they feel that the crisis is going to be a problem for Latin America also. And they will want to, and it, has, it is already being a crisis, they will talk, talk, to talk about trade. There are some, as you know, there are some unconcluded matters in, matter, in aspects of trade with the United States, and I am sure that everybody wants to know what's going to happen with that. There's, there's concern about protectionism, as we have, as it has appeared a lot here in Davos, the whole idea that... Uh, uh, growth in Latin America has been export growth, export-led growth in the past years, and therefore concern about the rise in protectionism is also there. There's concern about uh, matters of climate change, there's concern about uh, matters of, uh, of uh, drug traffic and crime and, and flow of weapons. Of course, energy is another issue. Three of the main providers of, uh, of oil to the U.S., uh, Mexico, Venezuela, and Canada, are in the Americas. So I think we have a very, a very large agenda to talk about. And what, what we, I, I don't think that anybody is expecting immediate, so, expecting immediate solutions, though some things have already happened. I think the announcements, announcements in matters of climate change have been very important. What they are expecting, uh, what the, the expectation for the summit and for the, for the relations is uh, around the, uh, something President Obama has said, that he's not going to do, be, be doing policy for, but policy with. The, 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 the countries. Latin Americans want very much to engage in a discussion. Migration is, immigration is also a very important issue. I should have mentioned it. They wanted a, a clear discussion on the issues and an attempt to really reach agreement on the policies rather than be subject to, a, to an American policy that they don't share or they, they, have, they have not been able to discuss. Thank you. Uh, President Calderon, we have a saying in our country. They say, well, when the United States uh, catches a cold, uh, we get pneumonia. And now it seems that the United States 
has pneumonia. <laughs> so, how are we going to do this time around? Well, probably we will get pneumonia as well. But, uh, but the point pre uh, from the President Cedillo is uh, I have listened all the day bad news about the economic situation in the world. Uh, let me say something positive aspects of Latin America in this complex economic crisis. Of course, there will be a very important impact in our economies coming from the reduction of the demand for our exports. But let me tell you that there are some very important differences right now. First, uh, in this, this time, uh, the origin of the crisis was not in Latin America. We coined in the past a lot of terms like tequila crisis, samba crisis, and tango crisis, and so on. And this time, well, I don't know what is the name of this new crisis. It could be, I don't know, Big Mac crisis or something like that. But, uh, but the point is there is uh, uh, one difference. But second is we learn from previous crises. As you know, we have in the past like, over 30 crises in the last 25 years in the region. So we learn a lot. And this time, in several countries, in Latin America, Colombia, Mexico, Chile, Brazil, there are good news in these circumstances. One is we have sound uh, banking system. For instance, in Mexico, the rate the ratio of capitalization is over 14%, which is probably one of the best in the region, or at least in North America. <laughs> Second, we have sound public finances. Uh, we made our homework all these years. On several countries, I cannot speak for everybody. We have very good friends, very good friends in the neighborhood, but uh, uh, at least our countries uh, had been very careful, careful about public finances. In our case, foreign reserves, for instance, are more than three times our total foreign debt by first time. Uh, and only to speak about this year, our finance foreign requirements are fully covered for this year. Uh, for the growth in Latin America, the average for the six past years in the region was 5% of growth. And uh, even in these circumstances, uh, the average, the forecast of IMF will, it will be over 1% in the region. So there is a very good opportunity for Latin American countries. And the challenges ahead is how can you use these assets, as uh, Andres Velasco said last night, in order to overcome the external shock that we are suffering. And one is we, we need to, to take care about the health of public finances. We need to take care about our banking system. But also we need, and by first time, we can apply counter cyclical policies. And we are doing so in several countries. But that is different now. I hope that we can take care about this bad situation with the United States. It's impossible to say that we can solve that problem. We need to work together, but uh, I'm absolutely sure that we are better than before to face this uh, terrible economic situation. Thank you, President. Um, let me insist with uh, President Uribe on the economic uh, question, but uh, mentioning that uh, Latin America has completed a, a period of uh, six years with uh, its highest uh, average GDP growth. Uh, we have to go back like 40 years to, to find a period of six years with such a high GDP growth. So we had sort of a mini bonanza situation in the last few years. My question is, are policymakers in Latin America going to regret that we didn't take advantage of this mini bonanza to push harder for reform process, and now the mini bonanza is over, or precisely because we will be a little bit against the wall again, this will give us an incentive to come back strongly to push for reform. What is your sense of that, President Uribe? 
this period, uh, what you call of mini bonanza, has been very short. Given the necessity in South America to, for, to overcome poverty for 200 million people. This is really a very short period. There are countries that have introduced structural reforms during these years. Let, let me speak about Colombia. First, we have introduced many constitutional reforms. By one of the reforms, we eliminated privileges in pensions. We installed a constitutional clause under which Colombia can no longer have special pensions schemes, only one scheme. We have introduced other structural reform to gear rational to the transfers to the regions. The reform has given sustainability to our decentralized system. We have introduced administrative reforms. In Colombia, we have <coughs> restructured 411 state institutions. Before the reform, these institutions destroyed value. Now they add value. For instance, in the oil sector, we have introduced three reforms in the state-owned corporation for oil, Ecopetrol. First, we eliminated some clauses in pensions and in labor. Second, we opened this corporation for private capitalization. Half a million Colombians put money there. When our administration began, this corporation had the power to invest $500 million per year. This year, this corporation will invest six billion without affecting the public budget, without increasing the public indebtedness. You see many countries in South and Latin America that have introduced structural reforms. Therefore, we cannot be blamed for the lack of reforms. You, you have to study case by case. At this time, we need um, in the agenda, many, many aspects. One is energy. In the past, when we had ups and downs in the, in the price of oil, where the price of, price of oil was high, everyone spoke about alternative energies. When the downs came, everyone forgot about it. Now we need to advance in alternative energies biocombustibles, without affecting food security, solar energy, wind energy. It is very important. Latin America needs the flow of, of uh, investments in the region, of, of loans. It is very important that the industrialized countries be aware on the necessity to increase the capital in the multilateral agencies, for these agencies to continue the provision of loans to our countries. Uh, thank you, President. Let us not forget that uh, Latin America is not only the Brazils, the Mexicos, the Argentinas, the Colombias, you know, the big economies. Uh, we also have smaller countries uh, with the smaller economies that do not have the voice that our big Latin American countries can have in the international scenario. Jose Miguel, who is speaking for the Central Americas, the Caribbean countries, the smaller South American countries? I mean, how are they going to withstand this uh, Well, I think it's, it's important to remember that. Uh, thank you very much for the question. There are 21 countries between North America and Mexico and South America there are 20, 21 countries in between and they range from small to smaller to tiny and uh, they are all I mean most of them are going to have big trouble 
they live uh, basically of their exports to the U.S., of tourism, and of remittances. And those three things are going to fall down, certainly. Of course, uh, we can always recommend to them uh, counter-cyclical policies. And some of them maybe can do it because some of them are not poor. But the majority of them don't have the resources for counter-cyclical to, to, uh, counter policies. They don't have money to spend more. Uh, and it's hard to explain to the population if the others are going into fiscal deficits, why, are not going into, why you are not going into fiscal deficit. And the answer, the answer is simple, of course. They don't have the money, and they don't have the credits. Nobody's going to lend them money. So I think that I expect that we're going to have trouble in many of these small economies, and the solution, of course, can only be multilateral. So uh, I think that we have to find ways to uh, put new funds into the International Financial Institute institutions, even the regionals, the IDB, for example, with the, the Inter-American Development Bank could do with a, a, re, a, re, a, re, a replenishment of its uh, of its capital that will uh, permit them to aid countries. This is not much money. By the way. We are talking about uh, one percent of the of the U.S. large economy of the, 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 the package that was approved yesterday in the House in the, in the House of Representatives. One percent of that would do the trick, and as I say, these 21 countries could probably weather the crisis in a better way. Uh, President Calderon, Me Mexico is part of the G20. Are you there speaking only for Mexico, or are you keeping in mind our brothers and sisters of, of Latin America? <laughs> of course, we are trying to, to speak uh, in the name of uh, everybody in the region, because we have common concerns. And let me say that we are taking very active role in the region, in the international arena. For instance, Mexico is, is uh, coordinating the uh, group of Rio, which is uh, the largest uh, group uh, uh, with the Latin American countries. We are part of the G20 and we are participating there. We will be in London in April. And of course, uh, we are talking uh, in the name of the Mexican people, but also we used to receive the recommendations and suggestions from other brothers in Latin American countries. And at the same time, we are participating in, in others' uh, fora like uh, APEC meeting, and we are participating also with them. And in particular, you were saying uh, Central America. We are uh, renovating our relationship with them the countries in Central America, and establishing a regional development program that we call a Mesoamerica Project. And the idea is to strengthen the relationship, but also to speak in the name of everybody. And we, the countries that are in developing situation, we need to raise the hand and say, this region is important to build a uh, a way out of this crisis. Why? Because, again, Latin America, as you mentioned it as well, uh, has uh, in six years in a row positive rates of growth. And one alternative for the growth, uh, global level is to support the performance of these uh, rising economies in Asia and Latin America as well. And one very important point that we want to raise in London is the idea that we need to redesign the multilateral institutions in order to precisely provide voices to other developing countries, but also to recapitalize the multilateral institution. Why? Because in this particular situation, the lack of credit, private credit, coming to developing countries, and in particular to this region, and the credit crunch and, of course, the, uh, the lack of uh, the stop of foreign investment in the region only could be substituted by multilateral, multilateral organisms. And one of our proposals is to rebuild them, to recapitalize the organism, and also to redesign the mechanism of uh, taking decisions. Thank you, President. Let, let me move uh, <clears throat> to a 
very difficult topic for we Latin Americans. Uh, and I think it's important because you two presidents have been uh, put in uh, an admirable fight on this question. Uh, you, President Uribe, who has been longer in office than President Calderon, and now President Calderon, uh, you both have been fighting against organized crime, against uh, violence in, in our countries. And we know that this is a very serious impediment uh, for our development. Uh, of course, I have to take the opportunity to, to make a comment here. Uh, a few days ago, an analyst in the United States uh, took the Mexican situation and then said that Mexico was close to be uh, something like a failed state. Well, I, I believe that that individual probably was the one who told President Bush that there, was, there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. <laughs> Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, and this is to say, to express my disgust with that uh, statement, but in any case, uh, I think it is just fair, fair to ask, the two of you and I will ask you to address it first, President uh, Uribe. Uh, with the present approach, are we going to be able to, to win this battle against uh, organized crime and violence? No, all the Latin American countries are fighting organized crime. And there are many wanting to move forward with this battle, but they have no resources. I want to express, express our great admiration for President Calderon, his determination, his courage. We need to persevere in this task. It is very important to get a consensus in the region. Security cannot consider an ideological approach. Security is a democratic value. It's a source of resources. Because there is that trend of some to say, ah, security is a caprice of the right. We are members of the leftist club. We are not interested in security. Security is above ideological Differences is a source of democratic value. And narco trafficking is the main source of insecurity in the region. In the region. Therefore, we, we have to continue this battle, uh, and we have to win this battle. One concern I have is that there are many analysts who speak about the necessity to legalize illicit drugs. We find this. In Colombia, we fight every, every day against um, cro illicit crops, against traffickers, against chemical precursors, against illicit wealth. During my administration, we have extradited 1,000 narco-traffickers. Last year, we manually eradicated 96,000 hectares of coca and opium, and uh, we sprayed. 130,000. We have a very modern and effect, a very effective legislation against illicit wealth. Every day we forfeit illicit wealth. What is the problem? The problem is consumption. Not only in the industrialized countries, but in our countries. We can no longer say that we have no problems of consumption. Beginning with my country, we have seen a uh, very worrying growth in consumption. And I see that in every country, in the vast majority of the countries, consumption is legalized at this moment. We are going to, we, we, we try in our Congress to approve a constitutional amendment to penalize consumption. Otherwise, it is very difficult to win this battle. Therefore, it is necessary to change the mind. Instead of speaking, about the hypothesis of legalization, it is necessary to speak about the hypothesis of punishment against consumption. And um, other very important topic. If this economic crisis strikes the region, I am afraid that we are going to see 
a very dangerous impact on security. Therefore, the international community should consider this. And we need to be aware of what have been the causes of economic growth during the last five, six years. Some countries grew because of consumption and the price of commodities. Others grew because of investment. For the new approach, it is necessary to consider that everyone has the right framework for investment. For instance, in Colombia, in addition to the reforms I have already mentioned, we have introduced tax incentives for investments. We have introduced a code of social responsibility, and we was enacted the law allowing the government to sign pact on stability for 20 years with investors. If we want to grow in the future, to overcome this crisis, we need to <coughs> think what is the main source of growth, consumption, it can no longer be. High price of commodities, lotteries, it can no longer be. We need a very effective framework to promote investment with social responsibility. Thank you, President. Your, your turn. Uh, yes, President Calderon. Well, it's a very exciting issue. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, uh, going directly to the question is, of course, we will win this battle. And it's important for our countries and for the world uh, to win that. Uh, in order to do so, we need to work in different fronts in a comprehensive strategy. Of course, we are fighting really hard, and I didn't hesitate since the very beginning of my administration to use full, plenty of the force of the state, including the army, to uh, strengthen the authority of the state in any single part of the Mexican territory. Um, we are kicking them, and we are kicking really hard. Let me express some data. For instance, we have some curious world records in this. For instance, we have a world record in terms of the seize of cash in one single operation. We seize $206 million in cash in one single operation. We seize in these uh, two years more than 27,000 weapons since AK-47 to uh, missiles launchers, uh, more than 2,000 grenades. And let me tell you, the total amount of drug that we seize will be enough to provide 66, 66 doses for each young man or woman in Mexico between 15 and 30 years old. So the point is we need to persevere and we need to take action in the preventive field. We need to reduce consumption. We need to be very aggressive in terms of education of the people. We need to be very aggressive in terms of rescue public spaces for the people. We need to, to work in the rehabilitation and treatment about uh, addictions. But a very important point is we need to work together. And for me, it's a pleasure and I really admire President Uribe for his effort in this matter. But I say I'm claiming and I'm uh, demanding core responsibility of other nations because we cannot ignore that the largest consumer in the world is the American society. If we need to call for responsibility in the American government and society and the American Congress in order to fight together this battle because this is not a battle of Mexico, or this is not a battle of the right, it's a battle for the future of our young people, for the future of our societies. This is not Iraq. We are not looking for oil in other thousands of kilometers ahead. We are fighting for our own territory, for our own nation. And uh, for me, it's absolutely clear. We will persevere and we will win this battle. I'm absolutely sure. Thank you, President Calderon. Uh, Ernesto. Before, no, uh, wait a minute. I, I need to open the floor uh, for, for, for questions from the public. But before I want to make a, a personal question, President Calderon, let me take advantage of this moment. And a little bit of a background. When I was uh, President of Mexico, 
President Calderón was really leader of the opposition because he was leader of the biggest opposition party. And he was a very good leader for his party, but he was very tough. Okay. okay, very tough. Now I want to ask you, how does it feel to deal with the opposition? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I feel very comfortable, I need to say. <laughs> uh, it's really hard. Well, uh, somebody says that when you are in the opposition, you are in heaven. <laughs> when, you are, when you are in government, you are in the, in the air, in the soil. <laughs> but the point is, uh, I feel very comfortable with the opposition because they are having a very responsible attitude. We passed in the Congress several reforms, and you know how difficult it was to pass them. As President Uribe, we passed a pension system reform. In order to provide you an idea of how important was this reform, uh, we are saving for public finances more than 30 points of GDP at net present value. And we pass a reform in terms of energy sector, and we can now allow the specialized companies to participate with Pemex upstream in the oil sector, which will be very important for Mexico. And so, so I feel sometimes it's really difficult. I understand you now. <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm sorry for uh, in any case, but I was, I, I, I felt very comfortable as leader of the opposition then. It was a very difficult time. You remember that? Yes, I do. We, we had a ter <laughs> tremendous crisis then. But anyway, uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> but, well, it it seems that, that, that the opposition is no longer in this panel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, right. well, we won. No, we are in different parties, yeah. but with all respect. And we need to open the floor for questions. So please raise uh, your hand and be ready to take a, a microphone. And of course, the questions are for the presidents and, and for insults, and not for me, okay? <laughs> Who wants to open? You have inhibited the public. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't believe so. Yes, we have a, a question here. It's a little bit the world on the reverse. Uh, we from the north, we are now very hesitant, we are scratching our heads, we don't know in which way to go, and you seem to be more determined. How can you help us to have the same straight line? <laughs> you can invest in Mexico, and you could be a lot of profits. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. No, that's <laughs> that's that's this, is the, this is the, way, that's the best way. We, we, we need you to go to Colombia to perceive the, the real image of the country. It is much better for you to go to Colombia than to hear my speeches. Well, uh, precisely taking the point, uh, I will again push you, the, the, the three of you, okay, to make a comment on the following, uh, so that people don't believe that we are not realistic, although the presidents are forceful and energetic. But history tells us that in previous uh, global crisis, and perhaps the, the, the previous one, which was really severe, was back in the 70s. And we had that uh, hurricane, which was the first oil shock, then the second oil shock. And we Latin Americans, when the hurricane came, we tried to swim against the current. And we did exactly the opposite that we were supposed to do to confront uh, that crisis. And that was the beginning of the so-called uh, lost decade for, for Latin America. Uh, we can see here that the presidents are very realistic about how difficult is the situation. But uh, again, let me insist, are we going to play defense or are we going to play offense like in the 70s with the consequences that we all know about? And of course, you, you know the Chile experience. Let's start with the... Well, I think that uh, there's no, no, no doubt now that uh, uh, of a necessity that, it, that the idea was lost for a few time, for some time in the 80s and the 90s of a very strong public, of very strong public policies to, face, to confront the situations in Latin America. We must, we must not lose sight that uh, uh, the states in Latin America are very small. 
I don't know. I, I don't think that in, in Mexico it's about 15 percent. I mean, the, the tax income, the income of the, of the Mexican state about 15 percent, 16 percent. In Colombia it might be a little bit more. Uh, I think that, we have, that at some point we are going to have to confront in Latin America something that's still pending. Is that usually politicians promise people things as if we were, if we were living in Scandinavia. I mean, health, education, housing, uh, public security, and uh, there's no changes in the, there are no reforms in the taxing systems. That's what, that, 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 I mean, a coherence between one thing and the other is something that Latin Americans are going to have to face at a certain moment. But I think that uh, we have, uh, of, the, of our crisis, uh, we have learned a lot in terms of governance. I think that governance in the region has improved very highly. We have stronger governments, and we have more realistic governments also, in spite of what you have just said. And they are confronting the challenges, because this is what, the only thing I wanted to say before is that it is very unfair when governments are judged very, very harshly because they are confronting challenges that come even from before. I mean, because these problems of drug trafficking and all that have been there for, with us for several years. But before, I mean, they were not confronted. They were not confronted enough. For example... Don't start blaming me. No, 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 I'm not blaming you. I'm not blaming you. I'm saying, for example, I was going to do an example with Colombia. When we had all the problems of the kidnappings a few months ago, I mean, the, we have to, you have to make the exchanges and all that. Before the successes you had on that, uh, nobody said that all the people that were to be supposedly exchanged, except three, had been kidnapped before the Alvaro Uribe government. They were all were kidnapped before the Alvaro Uribe government. But nobody said that. So I think it's very important to put an emphasis that th these governments are confronting the problems that they face, and that has to, should be commended and in any case criticized. That's what I wanted to say. President Uribe. We, we need to, to play events, not to play offenses. We need a combination of determination and realism. Even in the middle of the crisis in Colombia, our administration, we continue led by one word, confidence. Upon three pillars, security with democratic values, investment confidence with social responsibility, and move forward for social cohesion with freedoms. Of course, our economy has strengths and weaknesses to face this crisis. I will um, list only our concerns. In the, in the last years, we have passed in our exports from 11 billion to almost 40. But this year, because of the current situation and our neighborhood, we expect a fall in our export of 1.5, 15%. It will produce an impact in um, tax collection and in jobs. Therefore, we, we are looking to move forward with the anti-cyclical policy. This anti-cyclical policy has three chapters. Infrastructure, the net for social protection, and investment, investment in our country. We, as President Calderon has, has said, Colombia also has fulfill its necessities for um, borrowing this year, the government of Colombia. And we are looking for window opportunities in the market to begin financing the, the two coming years. Colombia has never defaulted. Colombia has a great goodwill with the multilateral agencies, even with the, with the market. But we need loans for the private sector because there are many projects in the country and our concern is that whether or not the investors will get the loans to carry out their projects in our country. Thank you. President Calderon? Well, yeah. defense or offense? I don't know. This Sunday will be the Super Bowl. No, I'm I, talking I, about uh, soccer or football. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, I don't uh, want to talk about the Mexican uh, soccer selection, uh, the Mexican soccer team, but uh, I have bad news about that. But uh, in any game, you need both 
And, uh, of course, we need to play defensive in the sense that we need to, to play with responsibility in public finances. But also we need to play very offensive in the sense, very active. And as you were mentioning, in the past, we had no other option. We needed to play uh, cyclical. So there were reductions in external demand or whatever. We need to reduce expenditures. We need to, contract, to make a strong construction of our economy. And the people suffer a lot. Now the situation is a little bit different. Now we are looking the worst crisis in the world since, I don't know, 20s or whatever. And we need to work really hard in a counter-cyclical way. But we need to do so with responsibility in public finances. And let me tell you some little secrets about what, why we are playing in this way and why we can do that. First, we are keeping in order our public finances because all the reform that we made is a tax reform or fiscal reform and we got an average between 1 or 2 percent of GDP in public revenues per year. But also, for this particular year, 2009, we hedged our, our oil revenues at $70 per barrel. Not all derivatives are bad in this case. And well, we are heads on that, so we can play aggressive in, in a counter-cyclical policy. But also, we are keeping as a second uh, barrier the funds, the, the stabilization funds of oil. And we have there almost $10 billion in addition in order to build next year an exit strategy for Mexico. So, who is going to win this Sunday in Super Bowl? The best team. And the best team don't play only defensive, don't play only offensive. The best team, we have both special equipments to win the game. And Mexico, I can assure, will pass very difficult times, but we will the game, even in economic fields. Well, with that word, we have to conclude our session. Unfortunately, uh, President Uribe has to get a transportation to an airport urgently. His assistant is telling me that I should hurry up. Uh, so I just so, want to, to wait for all this um, audience in Colombia. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And in Mexico. Yeah, but uh, stop in Mexico. Yeah, that's good. Way down that's to Colombia. So thank you very much, Insulza and Presidents. Thanks to you.